Jerry just gave me the signal. We are now live on our church Facebook page, and I want to thank everybody, all of you, for being here with me tonight here in the sanctuary, and those of you who are at home with us watching. So thank you all for being a part of this Wednesday evening. I never take it for granted. You choose to spend this time with me, so thank you so much. Well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Even though we finished with it, I want to pick up again with verse 7 because I, I learned a couple of new things about verse 7 that I want to share with you. So we're going to pick up with Genesis 3 and look at verses 7 through 15 tonight. And so while you're taking your Bibles, opening up to Genesis 3, let me also now take this moment to open our time up together and give it to God. So let us pray. Gracious, loving, Heavenly Father, once again, we are honored and blessed to be together, one with each other with you, through the gift of being here in your sanctuary and also through the gift of being connected, also on our live broadcast. And we just come now into your presence to receive a blessing from you, a blessing from your, the power of your Holy Spirit and a blessing from the power of your holy, living, life-giving word. And so, dear God, as we continue through this great, well-known story in this book of Genesis, dear God, we know it so well. We've heard all of this from the time we could come to Sunday school. But we ask you now to give us something new, to bless us and give us something new, some new wisdom, some new insight, and some new knowledge that we can receive from this great old story and grow in our relationship with you. And we ask all this now in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so last week we ended up our time together pointing out, talking about two things. First off, we talked about the, the true knowledge of that tree of, no, of knowledge of good and evil. The true knowledge of good and evil that the tree provided came Never from eating the fruit. That was not what the knowledge was about. Eating fruit wasn't going to give it to them. You see, the ultimate knowledge of good and evil came actually from not eating the fruit. You know, all that uh, they had to do, you know, is they had just trusted God and believed in what God told them to do. And then when the moment came, if they had just said no to the serpent, and if they had refused to eat the fruit, that's when they would have gained the knowledge. They would have gained all the knowledge of good and evil that they would ever need in this world. We'd have that same, that exact same kind of knowledge of good and evil. And even though they received it, they did receive it, they received it then with a punishment. They received it because of an act of sin, not because of, they, of being obedient to the commandment of God. And the second thing we learned is how the serpent, Satan, can use even full truths and half truths to deceive us and tempt us. Remember how the fact he told the truth when he told the man and the woman that if they ate the fruit that they would be like God. Notice he didn't say that you would be God, that you would be like God knowing the difference, which that's what we became. But he also used a half truth, a half truth when he told them that they would not die. When they ate the fruit. And this is where verse 7 comes in. It's a half truth because they did not die physically at that very moment. But it was at that moment that they began to die high. How? Do you remember? They began to die spiritually. Okay. Now, once again in verse 7, what we actually can learn here, though, is the two ways. The two ways that they began to experience spiritual death. And so pick up here with me and let's read this together. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. All right, so here in this one verse revealed to us two ways that they began to spiritually die. First off, their spiritual death came about because at this moment now, their clean, their clear consciousness was now marked with shame, okay? And we know this because how many of your versions actually have the words in verse 7 that says, you know, and they were ashamed? How many of you, any of you got that in your Bibles, okay? That's why we've always heard, especially in the King James Version, you know, that they, they uh, their eyes were open, they were naked, and they were ashamed, okay? 
Now, it was from this shame that they now wanted to do what two things? First off, they wanted to cover up their what? Body. Their bodies, their nakedness. They wanted to cover up their nakedness. And we know they picked fig leaves to do this. Miss Dale, I still couldn't figure out an answer to did it cause them to itch or not. I don't know that. But most likely they picked fig leaves because it's believed they were the largest leaves in the garden at the time and best suited for this purpose. But what was the second thing that they wanted to do? They not only wanted to cover up their nakedness, they wanted to also do what? They wanted to hide from God. They wanted to hide from God, okay? Now, understand. See, these were two people who at one point, they did not see themselves as naked. They were not naked in each other's eyes because to each other, they were actually clothed in what? They were clothed in the what of God? The righteousness of God? What else? The glory of God. That's the word I was looking for. What else? The love, grace, you know, the righteousness, everything that is of God, the power of God. They were clothed in that. And as far as they knew, they were not naked. But see, these were also two people whose minds were pure. But now their minds, their thoughts, their spirits have been stained. Their eyes have been damaged by the sin. That, not, that they just didn't you know, cause, you know, that they brought actually into this world. So the first thing is their conscience, their spirit is messed up. The second spiritual death also comes about as a result of their act of disobedience. With their act of disobedience, this means that what has now been broken? The covenant. Okay, well, the covenant hadn't really been set up yet. I'll be honest with you, Mr. Harold. The covenant hadn't been set yet. Very, but more, this is more about the relationship. Their fellowship, their relationship with God has also now been broken, which is also a spiritual death. The exact same things that what sin seeks to do to us, okay? But now let's look into God's response to all of this. So join me now and look. And join me here at verses 8 through 15. I hope to get that far. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you, whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Okay, let's stop there. If we get that far, I'll be glad. I'll be excited, okay? Now, it's at this point of the story that we're now about to learn of a number of firsts. There are a number of first things that are going to come about through all this, and they're going to come about because of the actions that are taken. Actions that are taken by the man, actions taken by the woman, but also action that is taken by God himself. So there's a number of firsts that are going to come up, and I want you to be looking for them, all right? Now, to discover the first one, let's go to the very first part of verse 8. The opening words of, of verse 8, and what do we now see God doing? God is actually what? Okay, he's walking where? Through the garden. Now, the question is this. Is God actually doing that? Is he actually physically walking through the garden? Look again at that. From what we read, we can actually determine God's doing what? Just, he's only doing what? He's just making what? We're not making the wind, but look at that again. Look at verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Rustling a leaf. Rustling. Or maybe the thing is this. It's not actual footprints that they hear. He's just making the sound. God is just 
just simply, more than likely, just making the sound of walking in the garden. He may not actually necessarily be doing it, but and that's a good possibility. I'm not saying he's not, okay? And you'll understand what I'm talking about in a moment. But when you read it, it comes across that he's just making this sound. Making the sound, because in making the sound that he's walking in the garden, he's also doing what? He's announcing what? Himself. Himself. He's announcing his presence in the garden to who? To the man and to the woman, okay? Now, there are two things that we can learn, that we can see kind of come out of this. First off, that apparently this happens when? Okay, in the evening breeze, how many of you got in the cool of the day? All right. But what does it really say? What does that really tell us? This actually happens when? In the afternoon. In the afternoon, but also apparently happens when? When it's quiet. Huh? Quiet. When it's quiet, okay, but it also happens when? Every day. Every day. Apparently this is something that happens on a regular basis with them. Something that happens every day. It not, it, we're not led to believe in any way that this was a one-time event. This is something that apparently happens with them, that God, every day in the cool of the evening, or the evening breeze, the cool of the day, God comes and join, you know, meets up with the man and the woman, okay? Secondly, that God does what, though? Now, this can go with the fact he could have actually been making actual sound. But the thing is this, it also tells us, secondly, that God does what when he comes to meet them? That he also takes upon himself then a what? How about a human form? He takes upon himself, maybe not a human form, but some type of form, what? That the man and woman can what? Recognize. Re recognize. That they know that this is God, Okay. But what is actually the first thing that's revealed to us? There's something first, right off the bat, that's revealed to us concerning God. And what it is is this, that God, the creator of the universe, God, the creator of this world, God, the creator of all living things, chooses to not do what? Chooses to not do what? He chooses to not have a relationship with his creation from where? Huh? From above. from above or how about from a distance? Above is true, but from a distance. The God who created everything, he created it all. He could easily say what? My job's done. All right? Let me pass it off to the other two parts of the tree. But God the creator makes the choice to not have a relationship with his creation from a distance. Instead, God makes the choice to take upon himself, maybe a human form, but some type of form so that he can not only walk among his creation, he can also do what with them? So that he can also personally walk. Huh? Okay, very good. Okay, my word is interact, but I like communicate. Can personally interact with them but also so that he can become personally what with them? How about involved? See, he does this. He can stay in the background. He can say, all right, it's all up to you. I've done my job. Instead, he doesn't choose to do that. God chooses to come, maybe a human form. It could have been though some way that they can recognize him. And he comes not just so that he can walk with them, but he can personally communicate, interact with them. He can personally get involved with them. This is one of the first things that we learn what? About God. Makes God so great. Our God is not a God who watches us from a distance. He, from the very beginning, has made the choice to walk with us, to be with us, to come into our world. But then look at verse 8, the last part of verse 8. The sad part is this, and as we read, though, the man and the woman, in response to God coming to the garden, they have now, what once again? They hid themselves from God, which most likely is the exact opposite of what they used to do. Most likely, what would happen if, if God were coming every day? How do you think the man and the woman reacted? They'd run to meet him. Can you imagine that feeling to run and meet God in the garden? 
Oh, I, I can't. I, oh, I can't wait to run to meet him in heaven one day. Just think what it would have been like to do it in the garden. I believe that's what they were doing, that they were running to meet him. It was something that they were blessed and able to do each and every day. But as we see now, they're hiding. Well, let's go into verses 9 and 10. Now, let's go on to verse 9. Because they are hiding, God does what then? He calls out to them. No, no he didn't call out to them. Look again. Who did he call out to? He calls out to just the man. Did you read that? He calls out to the man only. Now, the question is, why do you think God calls out to the man only and not to both of them? Why do you think he does that? Because God had already told him not to be the fruit. All right. God had given him personal one-on-one -on -one communication about commandment about all this. That's a good one. Why else do you think? Anybody else have another reason why he only... Huh? He's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the family. Even though the thing is, that has not been set up exactly yet. It does come about. But he is supposed to be the spiritual leader. The thing is this. We don't know the reason why, actually. We don't really know the reason why God calls out to the he only to the man. But we do know what? What is his question? Why did you hide? Well, does he ask that? Or mine says, where are you? Where are you? That's the question that he asked. Now, the question at this point has always been what? That when God asked, where are you? That Does this mean that God what? Didn't know where they were. A lot of people think this means that God did not know where they were. And the answer, of course, is no. He knew it. He knew where they were, okay? So the question now is, why does he ask that specific question? question. You know, where are you? Why does he ask that? Well, see, God knows where they are. And he could have just instantly come to them. He could have gone to where they were. He could have popped in on behind him. Boom! You know, something like that. He could have just, you know, surprise! <laughs> you know, he could have shown up with no warning. But if he had done that, the man and the woman would have most likely done what? They would have tried to do what? To run off and hide, hide again. They most likely, the first off, would have tried to run further away from God. But also their shame would have grown even more. And as a result, they would have continued to try and hide, for God, hide from God. And folks, that's the last thing God wants for me and you, okay? No, it's believed that God asked the question. Not because he did not know where they were. He did it because he was trying to, or seeking to have them do what? He was trying to what? To draw them out. He was trying just to draw them out, to lead them out of their hiding place and come to him. But what is the biggest thing, though, that's also revealed about God? Another first that we can learn about God from that question, where are you? You see, not only did God know where they were, he also knew what? What they had done. What they had done. He also knew what they had done. It's like the FBI. Like the FBI? It's the FBI that asked the question, what's the other answer? Uh, well, and that's true. Or, or a good lawyer. That's what they teach you in law school, isn't it? Never ask a question unless you already know the answer to it. So he's a good lawyer as well. But see, not only does God know where they are, he already knows what they've done. You see, the first, the next first thing that we learn about God is this, that from the moment that sin entered into the world, God has never done what? He's never turned what? He's never turned away. He's never turned his back on his world, on this world, or his creation. This is the first time we see this. Even though he knew sin, and he had every right to just say, well, fine, I told him not to do it. Now, you know, they made their bed and let them lie. Type of stuff. God, from the moment sin entered the world, he still never turned his back on this world. He never turned his back on his creation. And as a result of their act of sin, we also now have the first time that the man is not seeking who? He's not seeking who? God. For the first time now, he is not seeking God. But it did not stop what? 
Even though the man is now no longer seeking God, he's not seeking God, he's hiding from him, but it did not stop God from what? Searching for, him. for searching for him. For seeking him out, okay? See, here we learn another of the beautiful truths. The first concerning God, that in spite of our sins, in spite of our acts of disobedience, God is one who still seeks us out. He is still the one who's willing to come to you and me. And it not only happens here in the garden, it happens every day. And it especially happened over 2,000 years ago. And that's just one of the, another first beautiful things that we are learning here about our God. That's why the creation stories and even the fall stories are so important. Because they relearn so many firsts about God. But I look at verse 10. Now, it's in this verse that we also now have the first description or the first mention of what happened. In verse 10, we have the first mention of what? Fear. Thank you. Here is the first time that fear is ever mentioned in the Bible, okay? Fear, a reaction, a feeling that has now been passed down to all of us. Fear was never, was not part of the original creation. Fear was not something that God gave to us. We gave it to ourselves, or the man and the woman gave it to all, who, all humankind. It's been passed now down to you and to me. But that's not the worst part. You see, worst, we now have been the number one thing that sin wishes to do to us in our relationship with God. You see, what, we end up fearing God because we what God? You fear God because you end up what God with God? How about doubting? That's why we fear. We end up fearing God because we doubt God. The man's fear not only came about, but notice what? He's also fear is listed there because he's what now? Do you notice? His fear also comes about because he's naked, all right? So this fear causes him, first off, to doubt God, to doubt God's love, doubt God's willingness to forgive him. But he's also afraid this fear comes about because he's naked, which is another way for the man to express his what? His what? His shame. See, this is part of his shame, which is also the second thing that we now learn about sin. See, the second thing that sin brings into our lives is shame. Because with the shame comes the belief that we do not what? That we do not deserve what? We don't deserve forgiveness. We doubt God's ability. Or we doubt God's desire to forgive us. And we fear him. We fear the consequences. We fear what he may do to us. But also his fear came about because he was naked, which was his shame. And shame causes us to come to the point where we will believe that we don't deserve it. I, I don't deserve. What I did was too bad. God will never be able to forgive me. But once again, we learn that, you know, this is simply, that's what sin wants to do to us. Sin wants to bring this into our lives. But now look at verse 11. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Verse 11, this is my favorite part of the story. Now, from this verse, we now see another, excuse me, another very first. What is the very first thing that we learn here now? What are we learning here first thing and foremost from verse 11? We see the very first time what happens. The very first time what has just happened? It's the very first time that a question is answered with a what? What is it? Another question. And all y'all want to give me a hard time about doing that very same thing, don't you? You, <laughs> Mr. David knew where I was going on this. He started laughing before I even started it. Y'all give me a hard time about answering a question with a question all the time. But I do it because God did it. <laughs> you know, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for you too. All right? But no, okay, I'm just joking. I do love that. I do love it when he says, who told you that you were naked? And I've always loved that question. 
But no, what we really have here is God once again doing what? He's showing us how much he does care. He's showing us about how much he does love us. Because you see, the questions are not asked by God because he doesn't know the answers to the questions. Remember, God already knows. God asked the man these questions because of what reason? Why does God ask him these? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree I commanded you not to eat? God asked the man these questions for what reasons? How about because, you see, the only way for us to receive forgiveness of our sins and heal our relationship with God is by us doing what? Huh? Admitting it. First off, being honest with God and with ourselves and truthfully confessing our sins. You know, people ask, why do I have to pray? God already knows everything. Well, that's one of the reasons why. You have you pray because you confess your sins. You're honest with yourself, you're honest with God, and you admit it. You admit what you've done here, okay? And it's with this, his questions, that God then is able to interact. He's able to interact with the man in a very specific and direct way. The same thing he wants to do for us. God doesn't want our relationship to be broken. And he knows that the direct way, you know, the straight line between two points, things, is that you and I have to be honest. We've got to be willing to admit it. Be honest with God and admit it and be honest with yourself. Because if you try and lie about it, you're not doing any good because you're still, what, you're not admitting it. And God knows you're not being honest about it. And so he does this for this very specific reason. But now how does it turn out? Join me now at verses 12 and 13. All right. In 12 and 13, here we also now have two new firsts. Two new firsts of what's going to happen. Look at verse 12. So in his response to God's question, we now have the first example of what? That is now happening. We have the first example of somebody doing what? Or, or call, what's, what do we call that? Passing the uh -oh. buck. <laughs> this is the first time somebody has passed the buck, or in other words, put the blame on someone else. Blame the woman. Oh, oh, no, wait, okay, well, first off. <laughs> all right, so first off, as we see the man passes the buck by blaming who is now? He blames the woman for his sins, okay? And in blaming the woman, the man does what? You notice he doesn't what? He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't even blink an eye. He, he does it without even having to think about it. The woman did it, all right? Passing the buck. But did you also notice something else? Who else does the man blame? He also, you ever notice he also blames God? He says, the woman whom you gave me, or in other words, if you just left me alone in the garden, not created her, then I would have been, I would have been in the mess I'm in right now. So it's your fault, God. So he blames the woman, and he blames God for his mistake, for his sin, all right? But that's not where it is. See, not only do we have the first time now of passing the buck, we also have the man now committing the first act of what? Sin. Huh? Okay, not just not sin. I'm looking for something more specific. Yeah, he's already sinned. So it can't be the first act of sin. But there's something that comes with our confessing sometimes. Or like I said, trying to pass the buck. Not okay. Or that's caught, that's that's it. But we call it something very specific. This is a the first act of justification. You know how we try and justify ourselves. See, that's what the man, he's seeking to justify what he did by saying, hey, my stuff is small. What I did is small potatoes compared to what? To what you and the woman did. Trying to justify himself, saying, hey, I did, I, and I would have done it if you hadn't brought her on the scene. You know, and if you hadn't given it to her, and if you hadn't given her the ability to talk, I wouldn't have been in this situation to begin with. You see, so the bottom line is, 
He's justifying himself as well. Passing the buck, justifying. He's being what at this point? Huh? Well, defensive, but he's also being what? The macho, but he's also being what, y'all? How about human? How many times have you and I done the exact same thing? We try to put the blame on somebody else or we justify it by making ourselves, well, my, my part in this one is big is so and so. Okay? He's, what, what the, David, don't point at your mom. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, don't. <laughs> but even in fact, you know, in spite of the fact that he's passing the buck, he's trying to justify himself. What is the only good thing that the man does at this point? There is one good thing that he does. He, 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 admits, he confesses to eating. He, did, he didn't lie. You're right. He does not lie. He stretches truth, which I'm good at doing. You know? <laughs> but but he, he does confess his sin by admitting that he eats the fruit of that tree, okay? The bad part is what the... The bad part of what the man does in passing the buck... Seeking to justify himself. He's now done what? He's now done what? He's driven a what? A wedge between who? Him and the woman and him and God. Because of his unwillingness to admit his part in this, his own fault in his own actions, he's driven a wedge between himself and and the woman, and with God, okay? Because the truth is, you know good well she's not going to forget this. She's not going to forget he did this to her, okay? That he did what? It will bring it up every day. It will, bring, it will be brought up every, every day and twice on Sunday. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but now look at verse 13. We'll finish up here because it's 6.30 now. Look at verse 13. It is, and it is with the woman that once again, though, we see also now what happened. She's also doing what? All right, so, well, so she's what? She's passing the buck. The act of passing the buck does not stop with the man, okay? We're guilt, all guilty of it, okay? Everybody's guilty of it. And did you notice also that the woman, just as easy as the man did what? She made her, she passed the buck with what? No what? hesitation whatsoever. She didn't blink either. The woman made me do it, but the serpent made me do it. They didn't even hesitate. But what is the one good thing that the woman does at this point? Or two good. Other, well, the first one, other than admit to her sin. She admits that she also ate. But what's the other good thing that the woman does do that we can give her credit for? What's the one thing we can give the woman credit for? She did not try and put the blame on who? On God. On God. Well, on the man, too. But more importantly, the good thing is, you know, because who can blame her? Said, well, he did it, too, you know, type stuff. But she doesn't blame God. And I admire her for that. You know, that's the one good thing that she does. Other than admitting it, she doesn't stop and say, well, God, well, you made me. You know, you put me here with that man. You know, she doesn't blame God. And so why don't we stop here? We'll pick up there and look at the punishments then that come up starting verse 14. And I promise you, we got a long ways into chapter 3. We will finish chapter 3 next week and pick up with chapter 4. So again, thank you all for being here with me tonight. I appreciate it so much. And until we're together again, all of you at home, take care and God bless and have a wonderful week. Goodbye.